A reading from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. Listen for the word of God stirring within and beyond these words of Scripture. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, nah, it's Elijah. And still others said, it's a prophet, like the one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. We'll come back to that. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When Herod heard John, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter, Herodias' daughter, came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guest. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, seriously, whatever you ask of me, I will give to you even up to half my entire kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist and put it on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison brought his head in on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. For the word of God in its promise and covenant, thanks be to God. May we pray with one another. God of grace and God of glory, on your people pour your power. For if you pour your power on us, then nothing else matters. And if you do not pour out your power on us, then nothing else matters. Be with us, O gracious God as we count the cost of discipleship. We ask this in the name of your beloved. Amen. We are at it again. We are hot on the trail of the Messiah, and we're trying to keep up with Jesus as best we can, but he still moves too dang fast. The story just read is not about Jesus, the Messiah, the son of the living God. So you don't really need to think about him right now. Furthermore, this story isn't about discipleship or being Jesus' disciples. Jesus' disciples aren't even featured in this story. So don't think about discipleship. Well, 
obviously. You can't help thinking about discipleship. It's like saying, don't think about sandwiches. And now you're thinking about sandwiches. (laughs) Don't think about sandwiches. It's not even lunch. All we need to know is that word is spreading about this Jesus and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't figure out Jesus' identity. Is he John the baptizer? No. Is he Elijah? No. A prophet, like one of the prophets of old? Maybe. When King Herod caught wind of Jesus, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Faithfulness to God's very best, most beautiful gospel good news has dire consequences. Discipleship has its cost. For John the baptizer, discipleship led to decapitation. For Jesus, discipleship led to crucifixion. For Washington Avenue Christian Church, what will discipleship cost us? Where will discipleship lead us? I'm getting ahead of myself. Don't think about discipleship anymore. Think about something nicer. Think about sandwiches. Mark, the author of this testament of the very best, most beautiful gospel good news, is a sandwich artist. No, he does not work for Subway. No, he doesn't know how to make a cold cut trio. Yes, he does know how to tell a story, well, lots and lots of stories. And sometimes Mark sandwiches a story within another story to enhance the meaning of both stories. Not on that for a second, and we'll get it. Or or better yet, hear me out. Remember two weeks ago when we talked about the promise in the gospel? Mark introduces us to Jairus, the president of the synagogue, and his daughter, but then interrupts the story with a woman whose name we never know. She's known only by her condition, that that is, until Jesus calls her daughter. Immediately after that encounter, Mark takes us to the portico of Jairus' house, and we enter the room of the 12-year-old girl. We witness Jesus raise her. That's the whole sandwich. Another sandwich occurs later in the gospel. Jesus clears the temple, but Mark inserts that drama in the middle of cursing the fig tree and then explaining later its withered branches. There are other literary sandwiches throughout Mark's gospel, but today's sandwich, the one that's on the lectionary menu, narrates the cost of discipleship, and it's difficult to chew. It's hard to swallow. Mark sandwiches the story of the beheading of John the Baptist smack dab in the middle of Jesus sending out his disciples and them returning. So here's the sandwich. Last week, we discussed the path of the disciple, which, just as a refresher, means taking nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in our belts. Sandals are okay, but a change of clothes is one set too many. Jesus pairs up the disciples two by two, sends them out. They cast out many demons, and they, uh, may, and they anoint with oil many who are sick, and cure them. Next week, we'll hear about the disciples' return. We'll hear what they've learned, and that'll be the whole sandwich on discipleship. The inside of any sandwich, the meat, sorry, vegetarians, if you will, is the heart of the matter. Now, I know what you're thinking. We haven't heard anything out of John the baptizer since the first chapter of Mark, and now we're all the way in chapter 6. Did Mark just lose his train of thought and finally remember to recover something he'd forgotten to include? Why here? Why now? Five chapters later. Perhaps Mark knew exactly what he was doing, narratively speaking. 
He could sandwich this story right in the middle of the disciples' journey so that followers of Jesus then and now know the cost of discipleship. The cast of characters in this drama includes the weak-willed puppet King Herod, his new wife, Herodias, the charming, seductive, and unnamed dancer, Herodias' daughter, the powerful and elite members of Galilean society, the righteous prophet John the Baptizer, the ruthlessly efficient executioner, and John's disciples. We should also give a shout out to that anonymous narrator, the sandwich artist par excellence, too. Jesus is not on the scene in this story, at least not in the physical sense. He does not speak. He is not active. But we will learn that Jesus doesn't even have to appear in the story for it to be about him. Mark tells us King Herod heard of it for Jesus' name had become known. Well, of course Herod had heard of Jesus. Who could not have heard of Jesus? Healing after healing, including the one, you know, the man with a withered hand in the synagogue and on the Sabbath? Of course, the ruling elite went out to conspire with the Herodians how they might destroy this Jesus, the one whom some call Christ. We shouldn't discuss Jesus' treasonous talk about empires either. The empire of God is like seeds that automatically grow and like a mustard seed and mustard bush. God's empire more closely resembles a dense, messy, unkempt bush than a palace fit for a wannabe king. No wonder Jesus' reputation preceded him. No wonder some of some said of Jesus, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work at, in him. Others like, no, dude, hair is too short. He's Elijah. And then other wonder, others wondered still, eh, maybe he's just a prophet, like one of the prophets of old, trying to earn his wings. No wonder Herod said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. The story has no mention of Jesus. And yet, the story is precisely about Jesus. Mark goes on to tell us that Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his, brother's, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod married her. You heard me correctly. Herod married his sister-in-law, but wait, it gets better. John the baptizer had been yelling at Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against John the baptizer and wanted to kill him, no kidding, which really comes as no surprise. But she couldn't quite orchestrate it. Herod's family dynamic puts the D in dysfunctional. Herod dismissed his first wife, which caused no small conflict with his ex-father-in-law. Herodias, Herod's new wife, was previously married to Herod's half-brother, Philip, with whom she had a daughter. And the half-brother was still living when they went through the big D that does not stand for Dallas. Other sources state that Herodias was also Herod's niece. Now, I am no expert at genealogy or family trees, but I think ancestry DNA might have something to reveal there. Herodias is an aunt unto herself. Herod's family tree does not branch as it should. 
No wonder John the baptizer rallied against them with quotations from Leviticus. If a man takes his brother's wife, it is impurity. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. My family of origin is not quite as dysfunctional as Herod's, but we could give Herod a run for his money. But I do know what it is like for an overzealous wannabe prophet to hurl a Levitical charge against me. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. You may or may not know this Levitical charge, but there are others, too, with which you are likely familiar. Women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law says. Or anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, and marries another woman, commits adultery. That last one's Jesus. If you will pardon a homiletical confession, my mind sometimes delights in the thought of how these wannabe overzealous prophets might be destroyed, how they might end, how a pox upon their houses might give them a taste of their own prophetic medicine. Now, decapitation seems a bit severe, I'll confess, but anything less than that would be okay by me. A little schadenfreude plays in my mind for those who have hurled these so-called biblical charges against those I love and me too. An opportunity for Herodias comes, however, when the elite of the elite, the creme de la creme, come to town for Herod's birthday party. Apparently, Herod is so particular, so insecure, so anxious, so uneasy, so... Well, you you get the picture that Herod plans his own party, complete with an after-dinner entertainment dance by none other than Herodias' daughter. Though some commentaries caution readers that the text offers no sexual innuendo whatsoever, I want to respond to such commentators saying that this dance was no ballet, it was no Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake, Stravinsky's Petrushka, or Copeland's Appalachian Spring. This dance was a let me entertain you gypsy cabaret choreographed by none other than Herodias herself. She exploited her daughter's youth, her sexuality, and her body for her and her husband's imperial ambition. We know what happens next. Herod and his male dinner guests have no small reaction to the striptease, we'll call it. The king says to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. Seriously, I swear, cross my heart and hope to die. Stick a thousand needles in my eye. Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even if it's up to one half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mom, what should I ask for? And she replied, "Mm." the head of John the Baptist. Immediately, she rushes back to the king and requests, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Gold. Perhaps this was a sobering moment for Herod. Rumor had it that he even liked listening to John on occasion, tuning into his YouTube channel using incognito browser windows on Google Chrome so his internet history could not be traced. The king was deeply grieved, yet to break a promise would show weakness before his guests. Herod would appear impotent, and that was one thing Herod was not especially when the politics of the empire were at stake. 
Immediately, King Herod sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring in John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought in his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mom. And when John's disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Now, where where was I? Mark asked himself. Ah, yes, yes, yes. The apostles gathered around Jesus, telling him all that they had done and taught. Now, imagine concluding a story like that and moving on without missing a beat. That's the sandwich Mark makes for us to digest. But I'm getting ahead of myself yet again. The disciples gathering around Jesus is the beginning of next week's text. As interesting as it is to stand alongside Mark's audience and hear the very best, most beautiful gospel good news of Jesus Christ, I cannot help but wonder what the crowd's reaction was when they first tasted the sandwich on discipleship. So easy for us to immediately read from verse 29 to verse 30. But Leighton, in the gap of those two verses, is the liminal space in which we discern the cost of discipleship. Before saying yes to Jesus, before moving on to the next story in the narrative, we should think about it. We should chew on it. Letting its taste become familiar in our mouths as we count the cost of discipleship. Don't think about sandwiches anymore. Think about discipleship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one of the greatest theological minds of the 20th century. There are similarities between Bonhoeffer's own narrative and the text this week. John the baptizer is to Herod, as Bonhoeffer is to Hitler. The German theologian did not hold back in his criticism of the Third Reich's murderous campaign of annihilation against the Jewish race. Bonhoeffer was arrested and imprisoned for a year and a half before being transferred to a concentration camp. He was tried with other co-conspirators for participation in a plot to assassinate Hitler. And Bonhoeffer himself was executed on April 9, 1945, just two weeks before the Allied forces liberated the camp and three weeks prior to Hitler's suicide. Bonhoeffer wrote in the book, The Cost of Discipleship, The cross is laid on every Christian. The Christ suffering which everyone must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old person which is the result of an encounter with Jesus Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the very beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls us, he bids us come and die. This is the cost of discipleship. John the baptizer, Jesus, Bonhoeffer, all knew it too well. We must know the cost too. When I think of contemporary churches who have counted the cost of discipleship, First Baptist Church, Jefferson, Tennessee comes to mind. In August 2017, the congregation called the Reverend Ellen DeGoysia as senior pastor. The decision for the Southern Baptist Church to call her resulted in the parent denomination excommunicating that local congregation. 
The church was no longer, and I quote, in a friendly cooperation, the denomination said. But you know, to not be in friendly cooperation with the Southern Baptist Convention can mean being in cahoots with the Spirit of God and counting the cost of discipleship. Another. For many years now, we have sent our Pentecost offering to Galileo Church in Fort Worth, Texas. Galileo has missional priorities of doing justice for LGBTQ plus people, doing kindness for people with mental illness or in emotional distress, and celebrating neurodiversity, doing beauty for our God who is beautiful, and doing real relationship, period, even when it's hard. In the first five years of that church's life, they had more evictions than a slumlord. I'm sure they had more than they would like to remember. In fact, one time they only had a few hours notice before all their stuff was to be thrown out on the curb. They know the cost of discipleship. If I'm honest with you, I must tell you that it is really, really hard to preach something that you're still trying to figure out for yourself. But this I know to be true. Discipleship is impossible alone. Discipleship takes you and, and me, all of us, two by two, to both count the cost of discipleship and to hold one another accountable on the trail of the Messiah. When I ponder the question, what will discipleship cost us? I sometimes retreat into fear. I don't want to lose anything, anyone, nothing. I really don't want to die. And I imagine you don't either. But here's the liberating truth. Discipleship will cost us everything. But there's more to discipleship than mere cost. God pours out power on God's people granting wisdom, granting courage for the facing of this very hour. Maybe that's the hope of discipleship. Perhaps the hope of discipleship goes hand in hand with the cost of discipleship. For with decapitation, crucifixion, excommunication, eviction, any other shun you can name that threatens to undo Christ's disciples, there's ultimately resurrection, resurrection that promises Christ's power, power, wonder-working power to a people. Yes, we the people who have counted the cost of discipleship and found it to be worth our soul, our life, and our all. You see, I told you this story was about Jesus. Amen.